So before we get started, are there any questions? Are there any comments or anything so far what we have been dealing with? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to turn off the maps so that it doesn't take Okay, the next, next menu is adding inlets and outlets, okay? So what is inlet or outlet? Inlet means if you are going to model from certain point along the river, so for example, in this case, let's say I want to model only from here to here. I can drop an inlet here. That means I will not model this river here. You as a user need to provide the inflow at that point in terms of stream or water quality or whatever that you are studying. This is optional. You don't have to use this feature if you don't want to. It's mainly useful, let's say for example, you are going to study in a river that's going from another state to another state, and you said, I want to model only what's in Sao Paulo. I'm not interested in the other state watershed. So you can just drop an inlet. That means anything coming from an another state will not be modeled by SWAT, but you, as a user, need to provide how much flow or how much sediment or water quality is coming at that point. Then the model, the SWAT will simulate whatever the remaining watershed. Or it could be a lake. You want to say, I want to start from this lake as my starting watershed, okay? And model only below the lake. I don't care about what's happening above the lake. I know how much water is released from that lake on a daily basis, so I use that as my inlet discharge, okay? So inlets are the area that you do not want to model. You can incorporate that. Again, it is optional. You don't have to use this feature if you don't have an inlet in your watershed. Then the outlets, you will get output, model output automatically whenever this, let me remove this red line, okay. Whenever you see the blue line, okay, you see the blue line, oops, I have another one, same thing, just a second. Okay, yeah. So, you can see whenever the blue lines, the dark blue, not the light one, that the light blues are channels, whereas the dark blues are your streams, right? So whenever the dark blue lines, two rivers coming together, okay, that means I have an outlet here, I have an outlet here. That's automatically by the model, by the interface. So same way as you go down, there are two streams coming and joining, that means I have an outlet here, I have an outlet there. But let's say you have a gauge location, you have an observation data is right in the middle that you don't have a gauge there actually, or you don't have an outlet, you can add an outlet. So you can manually add an outlet anywhere in the watershed, thereby you will get output at that location. Okay? So in SWAT plus, you will get output at four different locations. The Hacharyus, the landscape, the subbasin, and the river. Okay? So, if you want a subbasin outlet, you need to add other than where naturally two rivers are coming together. If you want any other location in your watershed, like say for example, I have a gauge right here, but there is no two streams are coming. That means you need to add an outlet there actually. Okay? You either, whether you have a gauge or not, doesn't matter. Wherever you want output, make sure you have a location specified. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what we are going to do in the next menu, is adding inlets and outlets. 
In addition to adding inlet outlet, you can also add ponds and reservoirs, dams, okay, lakes. So you can also add those things in here. You can either interactively add one by one or you can load a shape file with all those points. In the, min, in the uh, manual, when you download the QSWAT Plus, there is a manual that tells you in the attribute of your shape file, how do you, um, uh, how do you denote or how do you uh, say this point is for outlet, this point is for inlet, this point for point source, or this point for you know, pond or lakes, you can specify those classes. Okay? So here I'm going to show you more on an interactive basis. So I'm going to say draw inlet outlets. As soon as I click that, it will open up a new menu that shows you the outlet, the reservoir, the pond, the inlet, and point sources. So those are the things that you can identify. As you can see, all of them are on the river. You cannot add any of them outside the river. Okay, So in other words, I cannot go and add a point source right in the middle of nowhere, actually. The point source has to be on the river. The lake has to be on the river. The pond has to be on the river. So you cannot identify. If you put it outside, it will ignore that automatically. Okay, So it has to be very close to or on the river. You don't have to be exactly on the river. If it's close by, it will automatically snap it. It will automatically... Uh, intersect to the nearest river. Okay, so let's say outlet. I do know that I have a gauge right somewhere here actually, so I'm going to go down like a stream gauge before it goes to the lake. I have a gauge, so I'm going to go down and put one right there. So just click left click actually, that's all. Can, can I translate just a two? Yeah, words? yeah, please. So, é bom. Eu queria só traduzir duas palavras para ter certeza que tudo bem assim. Um, no gauge, na verdade, quando ele fala gauge, é porque você tem uh, um ponto de medição ali. Então, uma estação fluviométrica, por exemplo, uma estação de sedimento, uma estação de qualidade de água que você quer trabalhar. Tá? Então, gauge, na verdade, você tem um dado observado ali de uma estação. Tá? É, só para ter certeza. E o outlet, quando é outlet, normalmente é o exutório da sua subbacia. Então, os outlets seriam, vão ser criados naturalmente nos pontos de exutórios das suas subbacias. Mas, então, se você tiver uma, um local que você tem dados e você queira extrair dados ali, você precisa inserir um outlet para um gauge, que seria, no caso, então, uma estação. Tá, então, se eu tenho uma estação que eu não é num exutório de uma subbacia, eu preciso indicar isso para ele, que é exatamente o que o Shrini está fazendo agora, tá, que é colocando esse ponto. Sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. Yeah. Good. So, let's say I want to, this, this is a long stream, I really want to have two, um, I mean, I want to have a subbasin outlet here, so I can add. So, like this, you can manually add as many outlets as you want, okay? So like I said, every time you add an outlet, you are dividing the watershed by a subbasin at that point, okay? You are delineating a new subbasin outlet at that point, okay? And you will get an output at that location. Yes? That'll be a good exercise for her, actually. So, if we make a mistake and we want to remove them, uh, okay, don't worry about it, actually, because later I'm going to show you that if you made a mistake and you added a point that you don't want to include in your watershed delineation, you can when you the next step I'm going to show you to select what you want to include. At that time, you ignore that one that you made a mistake, actually. So it'll automatically get ignored. And if it is not snapped, if it is not near the stream, it will get automatically ignored also, actually. Okay. So, same thing, if you want to add a reservoir, you simply select reservoir and say wherever it is. So, if you add a reservoir, it will automatically add an outlet and a reservoir in that location. Okay? And if you add a pond, 
most likely your pond is going to be on this cyan or this light blue color. Okay, these are the tributaries within the subbasin, right? So you can simply say, I want to add a pond. You can just come here and select that actually. That's a pond. Okay. So what is a pond? Pond is most likely unregulated water bodies. That means the water comes to the pond and nobody is going to open or close the gate. It automatically is going to overflow and go to the downstream. Whereas lakes are managed by the lake, uh, the river or uh, the dam operators actually. So they decide how much water to release every day. So managed is considered as lakes or reservoirs. Unmanaged is pond. Like farm ponds or ponds in a, a small urban area, things like that. Those are all ponds. Maybe you won't explain this concept actually. Sure. Um, bom, só reexplicando aí em português também. O, tem duas, um, tem os ponds né, e os reservoirs aqui. Então, a diferença entre eles é que o pond seria como se fosse um, um lago menor, assim, ou, ou então que não seja regulado. Então, não tem aí um, uma agência que regula a saída de água. O, o lago enche e aí a água vai extravasar. Tá? Então, você tem um lago não regulado. Por exemplo, nas áreas urbanas, você tem vários. Ou lagos uh, rurais para irrigação, ou para... Enfim, uh, então, seriam os ponds. Já os reservoirs aqui, que isso significa que você tem uma regulação. Então, você tem alguém que vai estabelecer quando se abrem as comportas, como que sai, quando sai o fluxo. Então, essa é a diferença entre eles. O reservatório é um fluxo regulado por atividade humana e o pond não. É o extravasamento de acordo com a área. Tá bom? Entenderam? Sim? Tá bom. But later, I'm going to show you that if you don't even include here, there is another option where you can input the water bodies as a polygon, shape file. So if you have a lake boundaries, if you have the pond boundaries, it can automatically include that, actually. It's not only this location. If you know, you can do it here. If you don't know, you don't have to. Later, I'll have another opportunity to add the ponds and lakes later. And again, there is an inlet. So just for demonstration purpose, I'm going to add an inlet. We really don't have an inlet. This is a very, very small watershed. But I'm going to add an inlet here. And I'm going to say this river, I'm going to. So that means anything above this point, I'm not going to model this region here. I'm going to expect the user to provide the inlet at that location, how much flow is coming at that location. OK? And then the point source, you don't have to add a point source anymore. We automatically add point sources in every landscape unit and every sub-basin, so you don't have to do that actually anymore. Okay, it's automatic now. So once you've done that, everything what you, the way you wanted it, click OK. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, yes. No, I don't, okay. So what is point source? Point source are the municipality or industry pollution. Okay? So this is the wastewater treatment plant from a city or a municipality or maybe sometime an industry like paper industry or sugarcane industry. So they have wastewater. Okay? Some of them are treated, some of them are not treated actually. So depending on how that water is collected and discharged to the river, you can add a point. So this is an additional water coming into the river. Sometimes they may pump the water from groundwater to supply to the city for drinking water. So that drinking water and the wastewater uh, generated from the house is going to come through a drainage pipe and it get treated and then discharged to the river. So that additional water or the new water comes to the river is the point source. You can be anywhere along the river, you can add that point source. But it has to be on the river. The point source has to be on the river. Does it make sense? Hmm? Uh, yeah, we could do the negative. Yeah. Yeah, negative. Mas yeah. eu não tenho dado, eu sei que tem uma fonte poluidora, 
Mas eu não tenho a quantidade do, de lançamento, não tenho nenhuma informação sobre isso. Ainda assim, eu po, é relevante colocar o ponto de poluição? Ou... Bom, <risos> depende, com certeza seria relevante colocar, e com certeza a situação ideal seria que você tivesse dados ali para inserir. Claro que não é sempre a verdade o que você tem para trabalhar, certo? Então, se você consegue ter uma estimativa dessa entrada, eu diria, utilize essa estimativa. Se não, não tem muito o que fazer, assim, sabe? É, mas você tem que ter clareza de que isso não está sendo modelado dentro do seu modelo. Então, por exemplo, eu tenho, estou trabalhando com qualidade de água, por exemplo, o seu caso, né? qualidade de água para abastecimento humano. No entanto, eu tenho diversas contribuições de poluição pontual que eu não estou inserindo. Então, vai ficar né, claramente, isso não está sendo representado dentro do seu modelo. Então, você pode, claro, inserir isso de acordo com estimar cargas, estimar concentrações, estimar né, vazões. A gente tem vários métodos para isso, se você quiser. Mas aí é uma escolha do seu trabalho né, em si. Uhum. Tá bom? Professor, can you explain again what is inlet? Uh -huh. Ok. So, like as I mentioned, Inlet is an optional input when you put, so that inlet give, gives you the option to start and stop your modeling anywhere in the river system, anywhere in the watershed. So here I'm talking about inlet. We added an inlet here. So what are we saying? We are saying we do not want to model anything above this point. So SWOT will not estimate how much is the stream flow, how much is the sediment, how much is the uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, above this red triangle. So if you input inlet, you as a user need to provide that information for SWOT. Because SWOT is not going to simulate that actually. So why do we do that? So this is mainly for two or three reasons. Main reason is, let's say you are on an international border and you don't know what the water coming from Paraguay to Para River actually. And you know, but you are monitoring how much flow coming into Para River from Paraguay, but you don't know all the landscape, you don't have the rainfall, you don't have the you know, information. Then you can simply use the inflow observed data set as your starting point and model below that area. Or it could be a lake or it could be an interstate boundary. So anything that you, ha you don't have data, or you have more confidence in your observation data set, or it can be a model. If there is an another model that you very well calibrated model from an another source that you already done watershed for this region, and you don't want to repeat that with SWOT, and you want to take the output of that model and drop it in SWOT, and then model only the rest of the watershed, you can do that. So that's what the inlet is. Inlet gives you the flexibility to model anywhere in the watershed. Anywhere you can start, anywhere you can stop. You are not restricted to model everything with only with SWOT. And uh, yeah, while that question is coming up, one more thing I want to point out, like Danny was saying, the point source can be both for adding new water, like the industry pollution or municipality or wastewater, but also to remove water from the river. Like, for example, if you have a water diversion, or you are going to take the water for irrigation, or you are going to take the water for city or municipality, you can also use point source for that. In that case, you put negative value. If you put negative means we are removing water. If you are put positive, you are adding water to the river. Okay, so it's a simply the same point source can be used in both ways. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, <coughs> eu vou falar em português. <laughs> Sorry, professor. É, uh, quanto aos reservatórios, eu queria entender assim: a gente coloca esses inlets and outlets e a gente tem que dar uma informação para o modelo que é, a gente já uma informação pré-existente. Mas quando eu penso num reservatório, por exemplo, a carga que está chegando nele, pensando aí num, é, em qualidade da água também especificamente, eu vou dar essas informações que estão chegando, mas eu também tenho que dar informações já da, da barragem ali de saída, 
é, para o modelo ou ele consegue estimar com base no que ele calculou que chega até lá e do que tem do que existe lá de fato ok so, oh, yeah. uh, bom na verdade, tem algumas maneiras diferentes de tratar o reservatório dentro do SWOT, né? que era um pouquinho isso que ele estava mostrando. Uma maneira seria como inlet. Então, no inlet, na verdade, eu falo, eu não quero trabalhar com nada a montante desse reservatório. Tá? Então, eu não quero trabalhar com nada a montante desse reservatório. Eu tenho os dados de saída desse reservatório e eu só quero modelar a jusante dele, então abaixo da barragem. E aí sim eu preciso inserir meus dados de vazão, de qualidade, etc. E isso você seria, seria aquela, aquele pontinho vermelho ali que seria aquele ponto de inlet. Tá? Então isso é uma maneira de trabalhar. Outra maneira de trabalhar seria, sim, inserindo o reservatório dentro do modelo. Então, eu quero representá-lo dentro da minha bacia hidrográfica. Tá? E aí, o reservatório, a gente vai ver depois, mas você pode inserir, por exemplo, regras de operação. Tá? Então, como é operado esse reservatório? Ah, se tal nível chegar, aí vai acontecer isso. Se, não, não, não. Tem essas regras que foi um pouco do que o Shini falou ontem naquela uh, decision table que ele falou. Então, esse seria para o reservatório, por exemplo, uma maneira de incluir. Você não precisa, nesse caso, inserir os dados de, do reservatório o ajusante dele dentro do modelo. Porque o modelo vai estimar isso para você, tanto de quantidade como qualidade. O que, que você utilizaria aí? Esses dados que você tem, você utiliza para calibrar e validar o seu modelo. Tá? Então, para que ele simule da melhor forma. Tá? Então, tem essas maneiras que são um pouquinho diferentes, depende um pouco do que você também do pretende, objetivo. do objetivo do trabalho. Deu pra... Ficou claro? Uhum. Então, tá. Ok. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So the next step would be once you identify the inlets and the outlets and the reservoir, the next step would be to select your inlets and outlets. Okay. If you are not sure whether all the points are close by, you can also do snap review, meaning it will automatically anything any point that you added is less than 300 meters, it will automatically join to a nearest river. Okay? So if I, for example, if I zoom in here, you will see they are not exactly on the river. So as long as the distance between this point and this line is within 300 meters, it will automatically add that point. If you think you need to increase it, you can add 500 meters, one kilometer, whatever you want to put in there actually. Okay? So now I would like to select all my inlets and outlets. So that's what I'm going to do, select inlets and outlets. Okay. You simply draw the box to select all of them. Right? Here if you made a mistake, you can also remove that point by using control key and select that box. It will remove that point from here actually. So you can add or remove any points that you're interested in. So that's what it's showing you, how you can use control over and over again and keep selecting multiple locations. And anything that you don't want to include, don't select it. Okay? So once you're done that, you should click Save. And now you can say Create My Watershed. So there are four selected now. Okay? So we had two outlets, one inlet, and one pond. So that's what you have selected. And you can say create watershed. So before clicking create watershed, you also have a new option in QSWAT Plus. This is not in QSWAT. is to develop your watershed subbasins by grid, meaning each subbasin will be a square grid. Okay, you can say, I want the watershed to be in a grid rather than polygon. Okay, so you can say every one kilometer by one kilometer, every 100 hectares by 100 hectares, I want that to be, yeah, uh, sub-basin. So instead of running the model as a stream network, now you are routing from one grid to another grid all the way to the watershed outlet. 
So you have that option also. So if you do select that, you have to check this box and you have to select how many grids. That means it can be only the multiples of your grid size. If your grid size is 30 meters and if you put five, that means every 150 meters by 150 meters is one subbasin. If you put 100, then it becomes every three kilometer by three kilometer. Because 1,000 times 30 is three kilometer. So every three kilometer by three kilometer will be one subbasin size. So this is only needed if you want to model by grid. Why would you want to do that actually? Sometimes if you want to integrate SWOT with other models, especially groundwater models, the groundwater models are going to be in a grid basis, like mod flow. Okay? So they are all using finite element and finite difference model. They use grid as the basis. So if you have a grid, it's easy to map grid to grid for the groundwater model. Thereby, you'll be able to model both surface and groundwater with the same resolution, with the same grids. But you don't have to choose this feature if you're not doing that and you want to just use polygon, you can do that. So here is an another option for you to develop even more type of models within SWOT plus. Okay? Any questions on grid option? Okay. So I'm going to click create watershed. So now based on all these different inputs, it's going to create your sub-basin boundaries and it will automatically remove other rivers because we are selecting only this river, right? So it will automatically remove other rivers that is not part of this watershed. Uh, one question, please. Um, if you work with mod flow, yeah. it's necessary to make the, uh, the grid? No. It is not necessary to make it, but if you make it, okay, the question is, if you are, if you are using a um, mod flow, do you have to have only grid? No, it is not required. Even, even in the current QSWAT, we have interface for QSWAT to mod flow. So we don't require you to do the grid, actually. You can do without that. But sometimes the grid makes it a little bit easier so that <clears throat> the percolation, the recharge from the surface can go directly to the mod flow grid. So that's the only reason. Otherwise, we do an approximation. We take an average. Okay. okay. So from the Hachari output, we take an average. But here it will be one-to-one -one, uh, relationship or one-to-one -one correspondence between surface grid and subsurface grid. But it is not required. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions on the watershed delineation so far? So we have... So you also see the four that we selected got automatically snapped. So if I, look, if I zoom into this red dot, you can still see the red dot is not on the line, but actually it is on the line, meaning it is snapped actually. So it's not showing you exactly what, what was done. Oops, sorry. So this is the watershed we are going to model. Like as I told you, it automatically adds an outlet every time two rivers are coming together. Okay? So every time that two rivers are coming together, there is an outlet automatically added there actually. So again, two rivers are coming together. In addition to that, we added two outlets. We added an outlet here, we added an outlet here. So it automatically, even though there is nothing coming together, we automatically divide that into two sub-basins. Then we also added an inlet. So what we are saying is we are not going to model this area, this drainage area. SWAT will not model this area, anything above this red point. So you as a user need to provide how much runoff, how much stream uh, sediment, and all the other water quality parameters as an input at this location. Inlet is only optional. You don't have to use this feature. If I did not put it, the SWAT will simulate this region also. 
Okay? And then we added a pond. Any questions in this? If you, may, if you, if you felt after looking at this something's wrong, you can always go back and go through the create streams and redo these steps actually. Okay? Or you can save this and you can compare multiple things actually. So you can create another project by saving this and opening that project and play with that actually so that you have both previous and the current. When I say save, it's very easy actually. If you go to your project folder, so this is your project, right? Demo one is your project. All you need to do is copy and paste. So now I have a copy of my demo one. If you make a mistake, I can always go back to that. So anytime during your project creation, if you felt like you need to make a backup copy, you just back up that folder. That saves everything in there, actually. So if you make any mistakes, you can go back to the previous step without needing to worry about that, actually. OK? OK. So now the next step would be creating landscape. This is the new. This is not in QGI, QSWAT, it's a QSWAT plus. This is where we are going to define the floodplains and the upland area. Remember we talked about yesterday about the floodplains, okay? So, I mean, it's, it's also optional. If you don't want floodplains, you'll go back to the original SWAT. Okay, the model will become more like original SWAT. But then why do you want to do that with the SWAT plus? So we want to add a, a floodplain so I say create floodplain. So these are the options that's available to create your own floodplain. Okay? So that is, um, you can do it by a constant buffer. If you really don't know exactly where they are, you can say, okay, I want to make a floodplain to be one kilometer around the river. So it's a constant everywhere in the watershed. It's not variable. Okay? It's just like adding a buffer. In, in the GIS, QGIS. Or you can use the DEM inversion method or branch length method. One of these two options. What does those do? They basically use one of the four methods I described yesterday in the presentation, the, what they call slope method, actually. We use that to define that. You can change some of these parameters, like how many number of cells. This is, again, a threshold, like watershed threshold. Okay. So we can do that by square kilometer, hectare, and acres, and so on. Or, and also, you can look at the slope position. Okay? If your land is very flat, you want to reduce this as small as you want, actually. If the land is very, very, as if, the slow, if the land is very steeper slopes, then you want to increase that, actually. Okay? So here, this, it says 10%, actually. So this is the maximum ratio of height of the point, meaning the height, the slopes. Okay. So if it is a large, I mean, if, it is, if you have a very steep slope watershed, you want to increase that, actually. If it is a flat area, you want to decrease that. That's the key consideration. So <coughs> let me go ahead and create it so you can see what, the, what it does, actually. So I'm going to say create. So that's your floodplain. So you can also use this with your satellite imagery to see if this is really floodplain. Because you know you can easily find out from the floodplain because you're not going to see agriculture, you're not going to, mostly it's going to be riparian, forested area. So you can see approximately where that follows. Okay? And if you felt like this is too wide, actually, let's say, for example, this is too wide for a floodplain, you can then try to reduce this. Let's say 5%, for example. Okay? And I can say create again. So you may be able to see, I don't know how... Clearly, we can see. Let me see if I can show both of them. Okay. 
down. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so this is the flood plane with 10, and this is the flood plane with 5. So if I take the 10 or first, actually, you'll see the differences between 10 and 5. Okay, so you may be able to play with this with some satellite imagery background to figure out which one creates better delineation of your flood plane. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to exactly follow your real flood plane because sometimes real flood plane is not really flood plane because the human may control the flood plane some areas. And especially in the urban areas, human will c control that with the levees and things. What do you call levees? Okay. I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, is it possible to split that river in two because of the flood plains? I mean, in this method, you can create one flood plain for the whole river based what? on the same uh, input, right? One. Repeat because that again. Repeat yeah, it. I'm not sure about the method that you created the, the flood plains. It's based on the slope, right? Based on the slope, yes. Yes. The, and it, it's called inverse of slope, actually. I mean, slope is. Normally, what you look at it here, uh -huh. if you inverse the slope, you inverse, instead of looking from up to down, you're looking mm -hmm. at down to up, actually. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So that you want to see when the slope goes up, we want to see when it has become flat, then that's mm -hmm. what we want to stop, actually. The floodplains are flat areas after the river, mm -hmm. right? So immediately the slopes start to go up, we'll stop right there, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the floodplain or the flat area just adjacent to your river is mm -hmm. called floodplain. Mm -hmm. As soon as the watershed starts to go up the hill, we'll, sto we'll stop the boundary of your floodplain. Mm. So that's what you're seeing here is whatever the flat area very close to. How flat is depending on the threshold you adjust, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you put that lower and lower, your floodplain will become smaller and smaller. Okay? If you make it larger and larger, it gets above much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, it depends on what's reality in, in your watershed, if it's how natural versus how human controlled and things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um, my flat area, uh, they aren't decreasing on my map. They are only increasing. I, I put, for example, 20 just to see, mm -hmm. and it increases, but I try to put five and it's not decreased, I have to. No, no, you need to uncheck this box. So when you come and look at it, they are all visible actually, they are all checked actually. The first one is 20, then the 10, then the five. Mm. So if you want to see the five, you have to uncheck the 10 first, then only you'll see the five. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can I like divide in sub-basins? And say on this sub basin, I want 10%. In this one, I have 5%. No, no. not right now. No. No, not by sub basin by sub basin. It's a, the, the whole algorithm works for the entire watershed, actually. So, this is where you have some compromise. So, you may be going through urban river, then natural river. Sometimes you may need to compromise between them right now. Yeah, you don't have the flexibility. We may, okay, I take back. If you want to do that, what I would recommend is you can take one of this delineated and do the processing outside. Okay? Then give the same name. So the next step, because we are not using this in this step actually. In the next step, when you do the Hacharyu delineation, that's why we are going to use the landscape. So if you want, you have the flexibility to do it outside the interface and bring that map again, then you'll be able to continue to work with that actually. Yeah. So that is a workaround, but not automatic. Okay. Any other questions on the floodplain? Okay. So we have other methods like branch length method and the DM inversion method or the buffer channel method. So you can create as many combination as you want before you use one of them, actually. <clears throat> so the next option is merge subbasin. What is this, actually? This is mainly to 
automatically merge a lot of the small subbasin into one large subbasin. Okay? Because SWOT is a hydrologic model, not a hydraulic model. So you, wa you don't want to have very, very small subbasin than a very large subbasin, actually. So you want to have average similar sizes. In this watershed, they are all very similar. Okay? They are not smaller or anything like that, actually. You can see. Each subbasin is somewhat the same. So you really don't need this here, actually. But I just show you how it works. Okay, you don't have to do this, actually. Just see how it works. Merge subbasin. You can say select my subbasin. Let's say I want to combine this subbasin and this subbasin, or whatever the subbasins. I can simply select the subbasins. I can say, okay, I want to combine this and this subbasin. Okay, I can select multiple subbasins like this, and I can say I want to merge these two into one subbasin, for example, if you want to. You can do that just by save and they select. Or you can do automatically select the small subbasin by selecting this box here, and you can specify what is the area, minimum area. That means if your subbasin, five means if your subbasin size is less than 5% of the total watershed. Okay? Then I want to select all of them and merge them together. Okay. So either you can manually select what you want to merge, or you can say, you can put a number and you say, okay, do anything. Or you can do it by area. You can say anything that is smaller than 10 kilometers, I want to merge. Or 5 kilometers, I want to merge. You can do that too. So you have the flexibility in how you want to merge Subbasins between the places. Can we get a mic here? Then, what would it give to us merging the subbasins? The simulation time will decrease, or I mean, what would be the advantage of that? I mean, the main advantage is not the simulation time. Its main advantage is to remove the small subbasins that creates sometimes problem. Because let's say, for example, you have a big subbasin going to a small subbasin. In, in the natural system, there is no, nothing called subbasin. Everything is continuous process. Okay? If the river is flowing, it's going to continuously flowing. But for modeling purpose, we are saying we want an answer here. So thereby, we are adding a subbasin. Right? So if you add a subbasin here, another subbasin immediately downstream, what happens is you have to take all this water has to go through this small, small river or small subbasin. Okay, so SWOT is a daily time step model. That means within the same day, all this water has to move through. Actually, that means your channel size has to be very large. Otherwise, you are going to flood every day, every time, because you are taking water from a big subbasin to a small subbasin. So that is the main reason why we normally recommend. Because SWOT is not a hydraulic model. Like if you go to HEC models. Flood models, they do wave propagation. Okay, so that's much different than SWAT. SWAT is more of a hydrologic; it's a volume-based. It's not time-based. Okay, so that's why you need to have the subbasin size is somewhat reasonable. It will not affect too much your flow, but it will certainly affect your erosion because you have to send the same amount of water in a small channel. Your velocity has to increase. Okay, if velocity increases, your erosion is going to increase, actually, which is unrealistic. Just because you have a stream here, the same continuous stream, you're suddenly going to increase the velocity. That's not happening, what's happening in natural streams. Right? So that's the only reason why this feature is available. Most of the places, you may not have to do this. In some situation, you may have to do it, actually. So that's what this merge subbasin features will help you to merge multiple small subbase into one big subbase. Any questions? Question? No. Okay. He's saying I'm just bored actually. So, so. Okay. The next one is lakes. So this is where I was talking to you that if you have your own polygons of water bodies, 
like ponds, wetlands, lakes, anything. You can provide that shape polygon, then we will automatically incorporate that in only requirement is those lakes and ponds has to touch a river. So in this subbasin, for example, you have a pond right here, pond polygon here, but your river only starts from here. That means it is not going to connect that pond. It will simply ignore that pond, actually. So as long as the pond is touching any of the river or water body like lakes, dams, reservoirs, as long as they are touching a river, then we will be able to incorporate that automatically for you. You don't have to sit and select each pond and each. So like we have in the Jaguari Basin, we had about thousands of small, small ponds. So you, you don't want to sit and type a thousand times, actually. You just give this as long as your stream is extended all the way, it can be able to include them as a pond. Okay? In, in the pond polygon, you can denote one means lake, two means pond. That's an attribute table. Okay? In the attribute table for each pond, each polygon, you can say one or two. Okay? Any questions? I don't have an example here to show you that, actually. So we will add those examples later. So once all this stuff are done the way you wanted it, now we are ready to delineate the watershed or complete the watershed process. So you simply click OK. So it's, oh, OK, what is saying? OK, this, there is saying pond ID 3. Remember, we added a pond ID here. This is the pond ID, which is 3. It's got zero length. That means it doesn't have enough channel to drought, actually. OK? So either please remove or move to the downstream. In other words, it's not having enough things, so you either you have to move it down or you can't have a pond there. That's what it is saying, actually. So if you go, if you I click OK. So what they're saying is there is not enough stream is going on. Either I know it is snapped, actually. But it is saying there is not enough. So what I'm going to do is we can simply go back. I'm going to draw the inlets and outlets. I'm going to say new. Uh, unable to load the shape file. Okay. No, I don't want to do. No, I think it's a, it, this is the one that called selected. There should be another one called draw outlets. Maybe it got deleted or it may be removed. I can go back, even do this, and then come back quickly, actually. That's one option. Or let me see if there is an another way to remove this point. Or maybe select, yeah. Yeah, just select. Yeah, you're right. So I'm going to select without that pond, actually, only the three. And save, create my watershed. So it automatically removed that pond actually that we added. And now, oops, I had to create the landscape again because I removed that. I had to go back. And I will also do one more with five. Okay. Done. We didn't do any of these. Now I'm going to click OK. So it's finished. <clears throat> That's why you should not just add pond just for the sake of adding pond. You need to make sure there is really a pond there, actually. Okay? For demonstration purpose, I just added a pond. That did not work, actually. So. OK. Uh, now you can see once the delineation is completed, the next menu is activated now. But you also see above this red dot, the inlet, this area is not, it's a different color. The reason is that area is not going to be modeled by SWOT. 
only the red boundary that you see here is going to be modeled by SWOT, but not this area here. Okay. Again, it was an optional input. You don't have to use inlet feature if you don't want to. Any questions before we go to the Hachario delineation? <coughs> that's, that's all about the watershed delineation. Anybody Ever. online has got no. questions? Uh, no. Did everyone, uh, was everyone able to do this and complete this? Okay. Yeah, it was no? only me. Questions? On the pond? No pond? You can. Se, se consiguió refazer? Yeah, uh, sim, o, o, o Shrini também teve esse erro. Acho que o mais fácil para agora seria, na verdade... Can you open the, the yeah. tab of the, the lineage? Just go back, to, uh, vai no, no selecionar inlets e outlets, e aí você exclui esses pontos que estão com erro. Pode ser? Acho que seria... Quando eu tento selecionar, tem ele não seleciona tudo. Ele seleciona três pontos e o resto não dá para selecionar. Como assim? Não dá por quê? É, não, não aparece como... não fica amarelinho, sabe? Você fez um seleciona. quadrado assim e selecionou Fiz, tudo, aí você tudo. apertou Ctrl e está tentando de selecionar. Ah, tá bom, deixa eu olhar então. Tá. Let me look. Sure. So, one of the question was, what is this additional menu here, actually? Right? This user-defined watershed mean, you can provide your own watershed boundary. If you don't want to use the automated system to delineate the watershed, and you want to delineate your own watershed, or you have your own watershed that you want to include, this is where you can do that, actually. Okay? So you provide your own watershed boundary, your own streams boundary, your own inlet outlet information. So everything needs to be created by you to the same format as automated system, then you can use your own. Okay? The next option is DEM properties. This just tells you what is the elevation, data set, projection, the, la the, the, uh, the cell size, the cell area, the total north, south, east, west, meaning the boundary of your elevation. So it's just the properties. You can't modify anything here, you can just see. And you can also specify what is your vertical, meaning your um, elevation units. Is it in millimeters, centimeters, meters, whatever the unit may be, actually. You can specify that. If you don't specify, we assume it's always in meter. And then the tau DM output, if you want to watch as the program runs, it's running the program called tau DM. That's the program name. So it it prints a lot of diagnostic message. If you got any error, error message, you should come and check this tab to just to see if there is any error, what is the error, things like that, actually. So if you don't have an error, normally you will not have anything here. Okay? Any other questions or comments? If not, we can just go to the Hachario delineation next, actually. So we are going to click Create Hachario. So what is Hachario? Hachario is the overlay of five different GIS layers now. Previously, it used to be four. Now, because of the landscape, now we become five. The land use map, soils map, the slope map, then you have the landscape and your watershed boundaries. So we overlay five GIS layers to identify the unique polygons that has got same land use, same soil, 
same slope, same of everything actually. Okay? Yes? Which number? Oh. Oh, you don't have the number? Or you do have the number? Yes. Are you okay? If you have the number, those are the subbasin numbers. Ah. Yeah, they are the subbasin numbers. Aleatory. Yes. Ah. It's, uh, it's how the watershed delineation has allocated the subbasin numbers. Yes. Ah, okay. But yeah. it's not related to. No, no. It's just a numbering scheme that it does automatically by the watershed delineation. Yeah. <laughs> So in this case, I have what, 10 subbasins, right? So this watershed is, has got 10 subbasins. Okay, so the first thing we are going to do is we are going to load the land use map. So select land use raster. Go back to the raw bit and go back to the land use. Land use new. So again, it's a it's a ArcGIS grid file. So make sure you select HDR. If it is a GeoTIFF, directly select the GeoTIFF and click open. So we are importing the data from the land use. Map. Repeat this. Okay. So select here and go to the raw bit, which is C, SWAT, SWAT plus, example data sets, raw bit, and then land use, land use new, and there is a file called hdr.adf. And select open. Next, you have to tell the SWAT what is what, actually, because your grid is going to store numbers, like 1, 2, 3, okay? But SWAT does not know what is 1, 2, and 3. You have to tell 1 means agricultural land, 2 means pasture land, 3 means forest land. What is the land use? So it's a lookup table, okay? So you can go and look at the land use lookup table, there are some global land use map. If you use the global land use map, you can automatically pick that table. Or you can create your own CSV file, comma delimited file. CSV means comma delimited file. So you say use CSV. If you go back one step, sorry, you go back two steps, which is raw bit, you'll see the land uses. Right? So if you want to right click that, I mean, I'm going to just show you. You don't have to do this. I'm going to just show this format. So it means land use ID, SWAT code. Zero means agriculture. One is water. Two is agriculture. Three is pasture. Four is forest. Yes. Um, in SWAT, you have like a lot of options for forest. Yeah. Uh, which one is better for Brazilian forests? <laughs> like that, I, I, I didn't find like many articles, like papers, telling this. So. So it it depends on the biome or where you're studying, I think, and. Uh, like rainforest. Rainforest. Well, you can use, for example, evergreen forest. Mm -hmm. uh, the forest. E. Here, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you also, like for example, you can change the um, some parameters inside of the forest configuration. So for example, if you're dealing with the Amazon or something like that, you can change for leaf area index or some, some other um, parameters inside if you have all, some of those. Or for example, in Kachinga or some different biomes, you may have some papers written on this, um, Maybe some thresholds or what to use or some soft data or something like that that you could change inside. So that's... Uh, so the main criteria is 
the routing depth, leaf area yeah. index is very, very important. And what you're talking about is whether it's a broad leaf or a needle leaf, uh, evergreen, deciduous forest. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you know what is the dominant class of water uh, forest in that area, you'll have an opportunity to choose the right one. Like the forest mix is like it's an oak tree. Like what it, kind of tree in the? F I mean, like I said, we do have oak actually. We have oak separately. We have pine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have some species specifically, mm -hmm. but forest is mixed or mixture of a lot of them actually. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so in those situations, use general forest. If it is a plantation yeah, that somebody is growing rubber mm -hmm. or somebody is growing uh, pine, then you can choose this. That becomes land use. Mm -hmm. Somebody is growing specifically. But forest means it's naturally happening, actually. So you have, like I said, broadleaf, needle leaf, evergreen, deciduous, or mixed forest. Yeah. Okay. So that's the category that you can use. So generally, this is the lookup table will look like, actually. If you don't know what these four-letter characters, we also have an another table, like this plant table. Okay? You can be able to open this up and be able to see what is that, actually. So it shows you. If you are, if you are going to use something like, uh, like, for example, alpha alpha or almond, or apple, okay? So depending on what asparagus, banana, so depending on what you're using, you'll be able to see what should be the corresponding four-letter character. Okay? So before you create your lookup table, you may want to check this file to find out. So we have more than about 130 or 140, no, now it's already 200, 250 different vegetation that you can use from. Okay, like wheat, soybean, cotton, corn, everything you can do that with this stuff actually. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, by the way, um, I think I want to show you one more new thing we added recently. So you, you see this? This is all temperature-based growth actually. If it is a precipitation-based growth, you also have the precipitation-based stuff. So I'm going to use this Robert land use as my lookup table here. Once you create the lookup table, you just select that lookup table. So the next is we have select soils, right? So soils map. So again, I'm going to select here, and I'm going to go to the Robert folder and select soil. And within that, this is Ministry of Water Resources. So don't worry about it. Just go to that folder and select HDR. So this is a raster soil polygon map. So each soil polygon will have an attribute, specific attribute. Okay, I'm going to show you that next, how to load that information. Op open. So now we are going to use the soil map. And you need to have a lookup table again. Okay? Because again, you need to tell the SWAT program what is soil polygon one, what is the soil name for that actually. So that it can go to the attribute table and be able to select that soil properties. Okay? So use CSV file. Do you want to see something? Here? Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It's very small letters. This is the. Soil map. Okay, I'll repeat that again. Cancel. So click here and go to under the raw bit. You have a folder called soil. Under that, Ministry of Water, MOWR and select HDR. Yeah, always, if it's an ArcGIS file, use HDR file. And open. 
and we are going to use CSV file and go back to the Robit folder. And here is my um, user soil CSV file. Okay, I can right click, sorry, Robit soils file. I can right click to show you what those looks like. So here is my soil ID. This is the polygon ID. And this is my soil name. So zero means LVX, one means FLE soil, ACH. So these are all the different soil names for all the polygons. Okay, so here I have for every polygon in the watershed actually, but if your watershed has got three soils, you need only those three soils here. You don't need to have everything. Okay, only what's inside your watershed. Then, I'll also show you the user soil. What is the user soil? This is where you have all the attributes about you for each soil. Because in the previous step, we are saying, here is my soil, then I need to know what are the attributes for that soil. I just gave the soil name. So now you can right click. If I want to show you here, it shows you all the information about your soil properties. Okay, so here you have the soil FLE and soil name, that's a soil name, right? If you, if you bring it in Excel, it'll be a lot easier to, for you to see. And here is the depth, hydrological group, number of layers. So soil A, soil B, soil C, A horizon, B horizon, C horizon, for example, okay? And that's a total depth. Then you have um, number of layers, hydrological group, total depth, anion exchange capacity, soil crack, soil texture, like C means clay, LS means land, loamy sandy soil, things like that. Silty clay soil, things like that. Then you have soil depth, bulk density, water holding capacity, hydraulic conductivity, organic carbon, then clay, silt, sand, clay, silt, sand, rocks, albedo, erosion, electrical conductivity. So that's for one layer. So if you have three layers, you repeat the same information for three layers. If you have five layers, repeat it for five layers, and so on. Okay, you can have up to 10 layers in SWAT. Maximum number of layers allowed is 10 layers of soil. So the depth can be two meters, 20 meters, five meters, depending on how deep is your soil, okay? Not all soil properties you may be able to get from your database. I think Emprapa is the one that should have soil database, actually. If a particular data is missing, there are equations to calculate, they call pedo transfer function, okay? So they can calculate those properties from other properties, okay? So we have created an Excel program. If you have only depth, organic matter, sand, silt, and clay, if you have these five parameters, we can estimate every other parameter in the required by SWOT, okay? So I can send you, I think I'm, you may have that already, actually, I can also send you, send you the uh, latest spreadsheet that you all can use. I think when we we will talk about the data in Brazil. Maybe we can show that better. Yeah, I think exactly. that's good. So one of the sessions that uh, Daniela is going to lead us would be about where to get data for Brazil. Okay, what data is there? Who, who can provide that? And then at that time, she will also show you the Excel spreadsheet, how you can estimate the soil properties using the pedo transfer function based on limited data that you have. Okay, but I think now it's getting better from my understanding is Emprapa has processed a lot of this data. Yeah, so now, uh, well, uh, Emprapa has um, a database that is open access for anyone. So if you want to check if you have data in there uh, from uh, soil properties and everything, you can do that. And there is a lot of data available. It's not as easy to sort through that, and uh, but it, you can do. 
So even then, you may not have all the, the specific parameters that you need here, and then you may use pads transfer functions. There is those that Trini are, is saying about uh, uh, from the spreadsheet, and we ha also have pads transfer functions that were developed for Brazil from different researchers that can be used as well. So there is a lot of yeah, information. Uh, and what if you don't have the depth information? How does the model? I think if it is an agricultural field, we recommend to have a minimum of two meters. Okay, because typically that's what the agricultural field. I'm not talking about eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is not an agriculture, right? Even though it may be grown like an agriculture now, it is not. So place like eucalyptus, you may need as much as five, six meters below the ground, actually. The soil has to be. Uh, so we at least recommend to come up with a two meter soil horizon information. Because just having one horizon for the whole thing is not practical or not reasonable, actually. So again, this is where some geology or the improper data set or the global data set might help here, actually. And about the albedo, um, mm -hmm. you, you, you show this information on the soil yeah. here, but like if you have like you uh, a building on top of the soil, it's a different albedo. How does the model? I mean, that's what, yeah, okay. Has the so the albedo is for the natural soil. If it is a building, then obviously we don't need that information that actually. It's okay. only for the open space is what we need. It's for the AT, right? Yeah. yeah okay. So you don't need that actually for the buildings and things like yeah. that. Because the, it's, it's by polygon of the soil. Before the building was built, it has to be a soil underneath that, right? So it's that. Uh, I, I don't know how the calibration works in, in SWOT, but uh, if you want to calibrate the model with a long time series, mm -hmm. and we assume that the land use changes over the time, mm -hmm. how does it work in, in SWOT? I mean, I, I don't know how long is this time series of Embrapa, and probably it's not too long. So for I mean, the soil is not going to change drastically. Yes. Soil may change based on how the land management. Yeah. Like, for example, uh, are you removing the uh, residue mm -hmm. to feed animals? Or are you leaving it in the field? So that can change organic carbon and things like that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, soil is not going to change too drastically from place to place or when the soil was observed. But land use, yes, that's mm. a different story. Land use can change continuously, maybe sometimes as frequently as one year or sometimes as much as 10, 15 years, once in 10, 15 years, depending on if you're changing from one category to another category, like forest to agriculture, forest to pasture, that may happen once in five years or once in 10 years and things like that. Whereas agriculture, crop rotation is different. Uh -huh. So this year you may grow corn, Next year, you may grow soybean, mm -hmm. okay? Or this year, you may grow uh, sugar cane, mm -hmm. sugar cane, sugar cane for three years, uh -huh. Uh -huh. then change it to something else, for example, uh -huh. okay? So there are the different things. So the crop rotation, you can do it in the management. The land use change from major category like forest to agriculture or forest to pasture, that you can do through the land use change input file. In the SWAT, in the Q-SWAT or the Q, uh, regular SWAT, it's, it's easy, but it is a lot restricted, actually. But in the SWAT Plus, you don't have, you use it as a decision table, like I was telling you yesterday. So you can change as frequently as you want, as many times as you want, as many HRUs as you want. So you can be more specific to HRU, whereas in the SWAT, in the SWAT it is by the entire watershed you have to do it. Mm -hmm. or by specific sub-basin, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, you can do it by specific HRU. So it gives you a lot more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll, we'll, so we can it, talk about it. It has no impact if land change, if land use I mean, it will, have, it will have impact, actually. But again, hydrology-wise, no. No. Okay. Water quality, yes. Yeah. Because water quality is the sediment. Like, if you change forest into a agricultural land, you are going to have a lot of sediment, a lot of nutrient losses a lot of carbon losses uh -huh, and things like uh -huh. that, actually. Hydrology, there will be some. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But also, it also depends on how big of a change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's if, my yeah. if the, the change is only 1%, 2%, no, it's not going to be. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about a watershed of 
10,000 square kilometer, uh -huh. 100 hectares changed here uh -huh. is not going to make a difference. But if it is a 10%, like a 1,000 square kilometer change, then you'll see a significant difference. Okay. Because the runoff process, what used to be below the ground in forest, uh -huh. now it's all above the ground. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So the runoff is peak is going to increase. Yeah. Okay. So that yeah. will be change. Yeah. yeah. My main concern is about the urbanization. Urbanization. Because it yeah. has a very big change in, in runoff. Yeah. Again, uh, it's yeah. A, depending on how rapidly, how mm -hmm. quickly changes. If it is a, like a half a person, one person every day, every year, you may not see a different unless you, are, you want to run a 30 year simulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where the urban was only 2%, now it's 20%. Mm -hmm. Then, yes, you'll see a noticeable difference. If you're running a five-year model for a calibration, it was 2%, now it's 4%, no, you're not going to see a major mm -hmm. difference. That, that small change. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Anyone else? Any other questions, comments? OK. So this is a, I know it's not clean when you look at it as a comma delimited file. But when you open this as an, uh, in the Excel, it will be a lot clearer and a lot easier for you to format and do stuff like that, actually. So now we are looking at the lookup table for soils. This is just a lookup table. OK? Lookup table for soils. So you simply select robertsoils.csv and then click Open. OK? Then, <clears throat> if you want to load your own soil table, like the attribute table I was showing you, like bulk density, water holding capacity, all this stuff. So that's what here, you'll do that actually. You so here and say CSV. And now you're going to use Robert user soil dot CSV. And then click open. Okay, so whatever the soil is in here should also need to be here. Meaning for every soil name or polygon in your watershed, you need to have for each of those polygons your user soil attribute also. Okay, so you cannot have three soils in your watershed and your user soil is only for two or the three of something else, totally different soils than what's in the watershed. So make sure your soil name, for each of the soil name in your watershed, there should be a corresponding attribute table information. So that's for land use, that's for soil and the soil lookup table. And now you can also set your slopes. How you want to divide your slope classes, okay? Typically, what I recommend is if your watershed is highly dominated by agriculture, then 0 to 2 percent, 2 to 8 percent, and 8 and above. The reason for 8 is anything above 8 percent, you cannot take tractors. Okay? You cannot do major uh, uh, mechanical <coughs> instruments into the field, actually. Okay? Zero to two are the flat area. Okay, two to eight is going to be much slopey area. Okay, so those are the two areas that farmers normally use. If you are in Asia, above eight percent they do perform agriculture, but they put terraces. Even here also you put terraces, right? So you can do the terraces also there actually. But once you terrace it, you are flattening. Okay, there's no more slopey area there actually. Okay, so. I normally recommend zero to two, but if it is a natural landscape, even anything can be any st steep slope is fine. Like forest, forest can be in 45 degree or 50 degree or 60 degree slope. That's okay. Okay, that's what natural landscape is all about. So I'm going to say two, two so zero to two percent. Say two to eight, and eight and above. So we have three slope classes. So you don't have to change the 999. 999 is the maximum slope, actually. So you just say 0 to 2, 2 to 8, and 8 and above. Okay. So we automatically take 
zero to two right here. So you input the number here and say insert. Just put two, insert, eight, insert. Yeah. Zero and nine 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 were were already there, so two and eight. Yeah. So you have the classes in between them. So it will take automatically the slope from your elevation map. Okay, from the elevation map, it will calculate the slope for each grid by grid, and it will create your class 0 to 2, 2 to 8, 8 and above. Yeah. Finish now? 12 o'clock, okay. What is that? Error. Yeah, in importing the CSV file of Rabbit Soil user. Okay, did you use a Rabbit user soil or what did you use? Here you should use Rabbit Soil. The next one you should use the user soil. User soil table should be Rabbit user table. Maybe you chose the wrong table. Uh, here in Brazil, we have a uh, Embrapa classification and we have five. Uh, Class. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, on SWOT, it's not possible to use. Yes. It's you can do up to 10. In SWOT plus? Yes. Yes. But the SWOT, we have uh, four, four classes. That's okay. Yeah. With the rest, you put zero. So if you have only four, SWOT will use four. If you have five, SWOT will use five. If you have 10, SWOT can use up to 10. If it is about 10, we have to stop at 10, actually. That's the only limitation. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. No uh, SWOT, when you use no SWOT, when you use only SWOT, when you calibrate the classes, it only allows you to classify in four, at least when I tried. O, é, isso, não, a, a classificação do, dos slopes, né, da, da declividade. Ela só me, de, me deixou classificar em quatro. Uh, aí eu estou perguntando justamente se no SWOT, mas pode ter, pelo que eu entendi, pode okay. até dez. I got it. So you are talking about soil, same soil, but different slopes. N no, right? yeah, no. just the classes on slopes, yeah. how many you can use. Oh, ah, no, I think that, okay, I think we have... Um, I think we limited to five also, actually, yes. You can have maximum five slope classes. Five. Yeah, slope classes five. I Sorry, I, I mistook the soil, actually. Slope class also five, yes. Okay, we are coming to lunch almost, so let's finish this last step, which is reading from the map. So now that we input all of them, you also have an option to generate full HRU shape file. See here, this is, don't use this feature if you're working on a very large watershed. It takes a lot of time, okay? So don't use this option if you're going to be working in 20,000 square kilometer or 40,000 square kilometer watershed. It can take time and you need a lot of memory in your computer. You need a strong computer and so on. This is a very small watershed, so I'm going to check this. The only reason you need that is to display your results. Your results, your model is going to be the same. If you want to display your results back into GIS, then only you need to select that option. Otherwise, you don't have to. Okay? So here we are going to go ahead and select it. So I'm going to just check the box. So we are going to select, we are going to create HRU GIS layer. Just like Subbasin, we have HRU. And the next one is selecting a floodplain. So remember, in the previous step, we created the floodplain map, right? We, have, we selected a floodplain with a 10% threshold, 5% threshold. Now you can include that. If you don't include it, you do not consider floodplain. Okay? So here is a way to even create two models, one with a 5% floodplain, another with a 10% floodplain. Okay? So this is how you can keep building more types of model with the same input data set. So let's go ahead and select this five, whatever that you have. Okay, yeah, we are going to stop in one second. Yes, in five minutes?
No, not even that, actually. We can stop before. Yeah. Okay. So that's your flood plain map. You select whichever the one that you want to run. So this is where you can add your own flood plain map. If you have your own flood plain map that beyond this, by subbasin by subbasin, this is how you can do that. Then click read. So now it's going to create your raster. We are going to overlay the rasters. We are going to delineate the unique polygons. And it's going to create your HRU maps based on all this stuff, actually. So this is your HRU map that it has created. So there are 10 sub-basins, 74 channels. These are the small channels, first order and second order channels, and 617 unique HRUs in this watershed. What is unique? Land use, soil, slope, floodplain, and sub-basin. So based on the five GIS layer, it identifies all the unique combination of all of them, actually. So when you come back from lunch, we'll, I'll go through and show you what uniqueness and things like that before you go to the next step. So if don't close it. If you close it, um, I need to check, actually. I would just say put hibernation. We'll come back and start it, actually. Okay? Don't shut down your computer, or don't, uh, what do you call, uh, close the QGIS application, okay? Put it in a hibernation mode, or put it in a power mode so it doesn't go off, okay? So we'll come back and continue with the re rest of the process here. So we'll be back at 1.30, starting back today. And also, um, I want to let you all know tomorrow afternoon we won't have um a session so okay so tomorrow afternoon we won't have session just yeah so one thirty.